Welcome to Construct Talk TV, and I'm Peggy Smedley. I'm hoping you were able to join us for last week's episode. We talked about the impact that the skilled labor shortage is having on the construction market today. I spoke with experts about how technology is playing a role in the labor shortage. And it was such a great topic that we couldn't cover it all in just one episode. So today, I'm excited to bring you part two. For this discussion, I can't help but tie in the economic component even more and how the shifts in both the commercial and residential market will impact labor. Stick around. That discussion continues right now. The shortage of skilled workers is costing the construction industry. The AGC of America says 81% of firms believe it will be hard to find hourly craft workers this year. The good news is some construction companies are improving employee benefits for craft workers. AGC even suggests 25% of construction companies are increasing their use of labor-saving equipment. Others are using virtual construction methods, such as BIM. But will it be enough? Today, Ken Simonson, Chief Economist for AGC of America, is with me today to discuss all about this. So Ken, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Good to be back. So Ken, let's talk about the state of the construction industry. What is your take right now? I think things are very positive. I've been traveling the country, talking to contractors in different regions, and also looking at the data on construction employment by state. And everywhere I go, contractors seem to be busy and expecting to stay that way. Uh, the latest figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that came out in uh, mid-October show that construction employment increased in 45 states in uh, the year ending in September, and contractors wouldn't be taking on additional workers unless they expected to have something for them to do in the near future. So do you think that's going to continue for the next 12 months, or how is it looking? Well, we do have to look at the broader economy. Obviously, construction doesn't exist in isolation. And there again, there's generally reassuring information. Uh, most of the solid economic indicators, which of course show what happened in, in the recent past, those have been very positive. Things like industrial production and capacity utilization uh, keep increasing. Uh, the real gross domestic product, which is the measure of uh, all goods and services produced in the country, net of inflation, uh, that's been uh, solidly positive. Employment uh, keeps rising throughout the economy. The unemployment rate, of course, is now at something like a 49-year low. And then business and consumer confidence surveys all suggest a high level of confidence. Uh, there are some some clouds. I'm not sure that they're real storm clouds, but uh, they've kept things from being totally sunny. Uh, we're seeing the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, signal pretty strongly that it intends to keep rising, raising interest rates uh, throughout 2019, not steadily, not dramatically, but about a quarter point uh, every three months. Uh, we are also seeing a gradual uptick in inflation at both the consumer and producer level. And then these very low interest rates mean more and more companies say they're having trouble filling jobs. So you might say all of those are negatives, but I don't think any of them is enough to suggest that we're in, at the end of the expansion or the end of demand for construction. So let's chip away at a couple of the points you said. Let's talk about the skilled labor part of this, because we've been talking about we have a worker shortage. What's your take on how that's going to be? Because we know the natural disasters have been adding to the labor needs, but we've had a skilled labor shortage even prior to that. What, what are we going to do to fill some of those gaps? And will that continue in general based on some of the things you just described? You're right. This has been the number one preoccupation of contractors for several years, and it seems to be getting steadily worse. Uh, I think you and I discussed a few months ago the latest survey that AGC of America released at the end of August. We had almost a 60 percent jump in the number of firms that participated in that survey, which was specifically about labor availability. And 80 percent of those firms said that they were having trouble filling one or another skilled craft or hourly craft position. And 56 percent of the firms said they were having trouble filling uh, salaried positions. 
Uh, in addition, uh, most of the firms overwhelmingly thought that the situation would be as tough or harder in the year to come. And uh, with the low unemployment rate throughout the economy, with the uh, tightened uh, immigration policies, uh, I really think that's true. The contractors are going to have to do more than they have in the past to try to get people to consider construction as a career, uh, to switch from some other industry, or to start out their careers in construction. So are we thinking about that? We're talking about prefabrication, changing industries. I mean, that's some big idea, you know, kind of stealing them, borrow and beg, steal kind of things in the industries and train them differently. Is that what com a companies really are going to have to focus on right now? Well, I, I, I would never say construction firms steal anything or anybody, but let's say uh, they, they in a are fun able way, to right? In a fun way. <laughs> Right, that they're able to convince people that construction offers not just uh, good pay right now, but uh, a clear ladder that you can climb to uh, eventually become a company owner or at least an executive or senior manager. And that's an opportunity that young people starting well, let out me ask you this. Uh, looking at fast food or, or driving a vehicle or being uh, at a hotel desk, uh, they don't get those kinds of opportunities. Well, well, not to interrupt you, Ken, but let me ask you honestly, have we done a good enough job to show the benefits of construction? Because I think that's an area when I use the idea of stealing, you know, Mm -hmm. hypothetically and, and, and jokingly, but has the yeah. industry itself done a very good job in showing the benefits of why construction isn't what we used to think it is? Have we done as a whole to say why there are really some very good career jobs to make good money and you don't have debt like you do in other industries that maybe you have a four-year degree that you don't necessarily go out and have a job after you've graduated? And I'm not making picking on going to college but there's opportunities in construction that i think we've not done a, a, enough of a job to indicate construction has some really great careers you're, you're right that uh, all, all of those things are true about construction. As an economist, I always try to look to some data to support my answer. Uh, the only thing I can say on this point is that in the last couple of years, the industry has been attracting workers at a higher rate than the overall economy, quite a bit higher. Uh, from September to September, for instance, uh, the industry added 4.5% uh, uh, to its uh, payrolls, uh, number of employees, whereas in the overall economy, it was about 1.7 percent. So we are bringing those workers in, uh, but uh, I think there's still a long way to go to get that message through to uh, both uh, students and, and people who have started out in other careers that uh, there are great opportunities and, uh, frankly, that uh, the image of what contract construction workers do uh, just doesn't fit today's reality. You and I have talked about how uh, people get to use drones, 3D printers, laser and GPS guided machines. You can even be like a, a, a super uh, comic book character with these exoskeletons that help you lift things without having to have superhuman strength yourself. Are we now, you know, hurting ourselves on projects? Are we meeting project deadlines? the way we should without the workers? How's that affecting things? Well, this AGC survey that I mentioned, uh, we had 2,550 responses, and, and we asked about some of these consequences of the workforce shortage that they almost all said exists. And uh, nearly half the firms said that projects were taking longer than they had anticipated and also costing them more. So as they go forward and sign new contracts or put in bids, uh, nearly half the firms said that they were raising prices to cover those costs, and about a quarter of the firms said that they were going to be quoting or are now quoting longer completion times. So yeah, I think owners are going to feel the consequences. Up till now, it's fallen mainly on the contractors. If they're getting pushed on the other side with increased steel costs and tariffs or other things that might happen, are they, you know, there's a push-pull kind of thing going to happen here. Is, is that going to enable that or what, what, what is the outcome? Uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. Obviously, a lot of owners do need those projects because they're seeing higher demand for uh, their goods or their services. Uh, but I think on the public sector side, 
uh, there really isn't a, a lot of room to give there, that uh, budgets get set long in advance. And so if the quotes come in higher from contractors, whether because uh, they have higher than expected labor costs or uh, tariffs or other materials cost increases are showing up, then uh, public agencies sometimes have to uh, pull back that uh, project and redesign it. They've asked contractors to, quote, value engineer it so that uh, there's less scope or, or uh, less, uh, uh, maybe less expensive materials going into it. So we'll see if that starts happening more. I have not been getting a lot of reports about that so far, but I think uh, that's one of the things to watch for in 2019. All right. Well, Ken Simonson, the chief economist for AGC of America, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. The National Association of Home Builders is one that understands the macroeconomic outlook for single family and multifamily construction. It says we need to invest in job training and apprenticeship opportunities, recognizing the job shortages that exist today. It has even pledged to train 50,000 new workers throughout the next five years for a career in the construction trades. Here to talk with me all about the residential market is Robert Dietz, Chief Economist at the National Association of Home Builders. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to join you. So let's talk about multifamily and single family housing and where we are right now with the economy and the starts compared to, let's say, 2017. Yeah, so single family construction this year is up. It's up about uh, 5%, maybe a little less than what we expected in terms of forecasting. I think the big change in the single family construction market is the rise in interest rates, which has created an affordability challenge. But the underlying demographics are uh, pro in terms of home ownership, and we should continue to see growth, even though we're going to be challenged by rising costs. Uh, multifamily has actually surprised us this year. We we expected multifamily construction to be kind of leveling off. Uh, 2015 was really the, the peak year for multifamily construction starts. We saw some declines in earlier years, but the start of 2018, we had a real kind of burst in uh, apartment construction nationwide. That's going to level off a little bit, uh, but uh, for 2018, we expect to end the year maybe about 5% higher than 2017. And uh, that market's basically trying to find a balance between supply and demand right now. So that's kind of an interesting factor that you're looking at this with all of these things that are happening. And we talk about material costs are going to factor into this. Interest rates are going to factor into all of these things. Labor is going to factor into this. So putting all of these, you, you kind of got the perfect storm coming into play here. So how are contractors and builders going to put all these things together and be able to look and kind of project with margins to what 2019 is going to be? Yeah, it's been a real challenge. If you think about the last three to four years, it was a supply side constrained market, particularly on Absolutely. On so it was about labor. It was about lumber pricing, which really has been on a roller coaster in 2017 and 2018. So it's been hard to forecast in terms of what are your profit margins going to be, how much additional activity should you take place. I think for the industry as a whole, we're going to have to, over the next decade, recruit a, next, a new generation of construction workers increase worker productivity in the industry, and then recognize that on the demand side, the demographics in terms of the millennials moving from their late 20s into their early 30s generally pushes us more towards single family, toward home ownership. But the rising interest rates where we are in the macro cycle right now will continue to slow that process. So we think uh, the home ownership rate is going to kind of balance out here over the next year or two. Uh, we're going to have some good months and bad months of data, uh, but if you look at the underlying demographics over the next five years, we should see incremental gains in single-family construction. But what kind of homes are we going to be looking at? We've been talking about a lot of urbanization that's going to be occurring. Are we going to see a lot of changes in that demographic when we think about this younger generation and what kind of living environment that they're going to want? So when we survey individuals you know, by generational groups, what we find is the millennials 
basically have the same kind of housing preferences that Gen X and the baby boomers have. They, they typically, they want to become homeowners, whether they can is a, is a different question. Same size uh, though, same size of home, a large home, or do they want a little bit smaller in that kind of, they want to be homeowners? I think it's less about uh, size. You know, it's about 800 square feet per person. Okay. And there's kind of an expected household size. You get married, you have kids. <laughs> But the, what they do want that's a little bit different than Gen X or baby boomers is they want more walkability. Uh, they don't want to have to buy a gallon of gas to buy a gallon of milk. So I think that lends itself. Amazon's had an influence on a lot of that, right? Absolutely, door to door. Uh, now, whether that's energy efficient or not, but it's the ease, it's the convenience, less time. And so I think that means in terms of a development perspective, townhouse construction, which is higher density, maybe closer in to kind of reduce that community cost. And then tear down construction, uh, basically improving the existing housing stock by building newer, more energy efficient homes in the inner suburbs. That's going to be an area of growth over the next five years. So now when you get to Generation Z, though, what's their mindset on what kind of housing that they're looking for? They're much well, more economically kind of focused on where they spend, but ecologically they're that that footprint, they want to focus on giving back, but they also want to make sure ecologically we do the right things as well. That's right. And I think they are more of a connected generation, even more so than the millennials. <laughs> they were born, we keep saying, with a phone in their hand. That's my line all the time I use. That's right. I have, I have twin nine-year-olds. They, they love the iPad. Um, but uh, when you look at Gen Z from, from top to bottom, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, first, like any other generation, they're going to hit the apartment markets. They're going to look for that walkability. Uh, again, I think, you know, central cities, a little bit of uh, additional multifamily, and then inner suburbs for the single family is going to be growth areas going forward. Do you think we, when we, you look at these generations, and you've been doing this for a long time as the National Association of Home Builders, we keep seeing these generations evolve. And do you see that cyclical behavior in home building continuing to evolve? And as builders, they have to kind of fight through that. We have a lot of cyclical. We see recessions coming, and it's something you have to tell builders and contractors to really understand you have to weather these storms in the building industry because that's what happens. You know, the cycle of family owning a home is cyclical as well. That's absolutely true. So you think about the macroeconomic conditions, financing, interest rates, those are kind of the short-term cyclical effects that ebb and flow, but it's the demographics that ultimately provide the stage in which home building takes place. So for the baby boomers, the senior housing market is hot. The, the baby boomers are the wealthiest generation in American history. Uh, they're ready to remodel. They're ready to age in place. Uh, there's some movement taking place, generating growth in markets like Florida and uh, Phoenix. And then Gen X, I'm a Gen Xer myself, uh, we're often forgotten in between the, the millennials and the baby boomers. And Gen X is increasingly going to be the buyers of new construction. 70% uh, of newly built homes are sold to move up buyers. And that's going to be Gen X over the next few years. So we're a smaller demographic, but home builders are going to have to cater to us as well as thinking about providing homes for the millennials. Looking, at ahead, looking ahead, what do builders need to do now in hunkering down? Because we look right now, things look w good, but we always know as the builders that what's good, sometimes there's a lot of things you got to prepare for and think about technology and think about how to leverage these good times to make it when the bad times come. Are there things that you as the National Association of Home Builder advise builders and contractors to think about when the good times are here? I think our primary advice right now is, particularly as housing affordability has deteriorated because home prices have gone up, which is generally viewed as a good thing by the market, but it's a tax to buy in a home. And you combine those rising home prices with higher interest rates, and affordability is at a 10-year low. So that and the possibility of a recession sometime over the next two or three years means builders need to be thinking about short-term and long-term. The short term is don't get too far out ahead in terms of your land holdings, your production pipeline, build to the demand that's immediately in front of you, and don't get too over leveraged in terms of going out and acquiring debt. On the long run, be prepared for a really good stretch of home building because with the millennials moving from their late 20s to their early 30s, we're going to have to build millions of more homes over the next 10 years. 
Well, Robert Dietz, Chief Economist at the National Station of Home Builders, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Absolutely. It's good to join you. I want to challenge you a little bit today. So if you don't already know this, the construction industry is very near and dear to my heart. But the only way we can grow and change is to be challenged. So what educational requirements do you have for your construction workers today? Is it a bachelor's, an associate's, something else entirely? What is required of your CAD designers, your estimators, your VDC specialists? How about your heavy equipment operators, your workers at the job site? Is it the same as it was, let's say, 10 years ago? I want to challenge you to think differently about the educational requirements of your workers today and in the future. Now, here's why. Generation Z, or Gen Z, is the next younger generation coming to your job site. Now, if you don't already know who they are, I'll walk you through it here today. They learn and seek knowledge very differently than those that have come before them. They're willing to gain online skills and training, and they're not as inclined to sit in a classroom setting. Now, they also elect very practical career choices. Now, this is great news for our construction industry. Now, Gen Z accounts for roughly 24% of the world's population today. Now, roughly, that's 1.8 billion people. So we need to understand how they are learning. And for construction, that means reconsidering the educational requirements of young workers. Before we dive into Gen Z and who they are, I think the first step is to understand all the different generations and how they are impacting construction. So let's start with all the baby boomers. That would be me. Now, I recognize many of us and many of them are getting ready to retire, but they still have an impact on the workforce today. And this generation was born between 1946 and 1964. Now, this workforce has a very strong work ethic and has been very loyal to employers. While this group will acquire the skills they need to get the job done, many are very hesitant about technology adoption. And this generation is on the verge of leaving the industry, as I mentioned earlier, ready to retire. And they're going to be, I guess you could say, a gap between when they leave and when we as all have been saying this artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of this other technology really kicks in and helps the industry. So let's not fool ourselves. I don't think the industry is really prepared for all of this transition just yet. And we have other younger generations to consider. So let's talk about what's up next, Generation X. Now, this generation was born between the years 1965 and 1980. Now, they're often very cautious, conservative, and tend to save. They also work smarter with greater output, and they assimilate to technology adoption as needed. Now, let's continue down the line to what everybody talks about is the millennials. Now, millennials get a bad rap, but they have a lot to bring to the table and to the construction industry. Generally speaking, millennials were born between 1981 and the year 2000, and they also are more diverse than any previous generations, first to grow up in the digital world. While they can be ambitious, they're not entirely focused, and they are always multitasking, as we've seen with any time they pick up a phone. And they tend to look at what's next in terms of a career. Now it's time to look at the next younger generation, as I stated at the onset of this segment, and let's talk about Generation Z. Some are calling them the throwback generation, which I love this term because this is because they act and think more like a boomer than a millennial. This generation is very focused on money and saving, and they are also very connected and collaborative. Like millennials, they are good at multitasking. In fact, I think they were born with a phone in their hand. They are also very good at making decisions very quickly in roughly eight seconds, if you can believe that. This generation is also very entrepreneurial. But more than anything else, we need to recognize this segment of the population seeks knowledge very uniquely in their own personal way. To date, the construction industry is simply not doing enough to entice this generation to join the construction workforce. 
Technology and innovative processes is certainly one way to do that, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Now is the time to rally this innovative generation to see the power of construction. And we are going to explore this topic of educational requirements for young workers in our next episode. As I like to say, we are better when we all work together. So make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, your fierce advocates for construction.